So welcome everybody to our third survey um, that the Headache and Migraine Policy Forum is doing together with Migraine Meanderings. This has been um, a really wonderful partnership that we're doing together and definitely appreciative of HNPF and everything that they do, I think is a great example of, of partnerships and playing to each other's strengths in the migraine advocacy field. So today we are going to be looking at the results for our most recent patient survey on medical devices for migraine and other headache disorders. And as most people know, this is no particular passion of mine um, because we do have five FDA cleared medical devices for migraine, but there's still a tremendous lack of awareness about them. And to some extent, a lack of willingness uh, for doctors to prescribe them or for patients to try them. And so we're gonna look at some of these results and hopefully it will give us a bird's eye view into the feedback from uh, the people who at least took the survey this time. So let's go to slide two and again to introduce my own organization. Uh, so uh, my name is Shoshana Lepson, as many of you know, um, and I am the executive director of Migraine Meanderings. And our mission is to provide patient oriented resources, encouragement, support and education for people who live with migraine to raise public, public awareness about this disease and to empower patient voices. Lindsay. Thanks Shoshana and welcome everyone for joining. Um, I, uh, just to echo what Shoshana said, this is a great partnership. We are um, HMPF, the Headache and Migraine Policy Forum is um, so pleased to be able to present this information. We serve as sort of the quarterback, if you will, for the community, but as a coalition have many members, almost uh, two dozen, including migraine meanderings, that really seek to work together as a community to elevate um, policy issues on the state and federal level and with national payers. And so this is absolutely in keeping with our mission. Um, we are uh, hopeful to educate not only the um, community, but also payers on some of this real world evidence that you're about to hear today. So with that, I'll let Shoshana kick off um, the uh, one on one about the survey. Wonderful. Thank you. OK, so let's take a look at the survey results. And as we go through this, please feel free to put your questions into the chat. Um, uh, there's actually a Q&A section, so please do that. We will get to your live questions at the end and answer them to the best of our ability and also Feel free to utilize the chat as well. We'd like to know, you know, who you are. Uh, are you representing a medical device company? Are you a patient? Are you a healthcare professional? Have you tried a medical device? Um, have you thought about trying a medical device? And if so, which ones have you tried or thought about trying? So let's look at the demographics for this survey. Um, so we did have fewer people participate in this survey than our other ones. Generally, we get around about 500 people. It wasn't altogether a surprise. It was disappointing, but probably what we would expect it just because when people see medical devices for migraine, um, there's just not as much response as there is when we look at medications, to be quite honest. Um, and so it was harder to get people to participate. We were really excited that we did end up getting 326 people. Uh, so that was good. But I think it was just indicative of the lack of awareness of medical devices and the important role they play in migraine treatment options. So the demographics for our, this particular survey, very similar to the other surveys that we have run. It is heavily skewed on the chronic side, which we know is not um, indicative for the general population for people with migraine, but it does tend to be indicative of the population for people who are involved with advocacy organizations. So 66% of people have chronic migraine. They have 15 to 30 days uh, of migraine headache days per month. 22% are high frequency episodics, that's 18 to 14 days, uh, which in many cases is, is just as or almost just as disabling as people of chronic migraine, depending on the, you know, the severity and responses to treatment for that migraine. And then 12% had one to seven days per month, and we did um, take in people for the survey who had less than one migraine day per month. For health insurance coverage, we're seeing is almost 50-50, so 42% of people have Medicare, Medicaid, 55% of people had commercial insurance, 14% had other, I'm not entirely sure what that is, I'm gonna presume maybe it means they don't have insurance, um, but, and then there's obviously some overlap in case you're wondering why that doesn't add up to 100%. Some people have commercial insurance and they also have Medicare, Medicaid. And then for age, Again, heavily skewed to the older age set, and this is going to be very important later when Lindsay presents some of her results. So we're seeing that only 3% were 18 to 25, 
uh, 15 percent of people were 26 to 40. And we really need to do a better job of reaching out into that younger age group because we know that migraine often starts in childhood um, and certainly by uh, teens and college years. And so we need to figure out a way to get into that demographic um, and encourage them to start participating in surveys so we can hear the voice and so we can start um, just educating people about the importance of early treatment for migraine. 51% of people, obviously this over half percent, are in the 41 to 55% of 55 age range. And then 31% of 56 plus. So that's good because we're actually starting to hear from people who are older, which is really important because it's a misnomer that migraine just stops, especially for women when they you know, hit menopause, uh, that it often just continues, sometimes even starts, sometimes it gets worse, um, and especially in, in the perimenopausal years. So it's good to hear from people at the 56 plus age range. And then gender, again, heavily skewed, 94% uh, women, 4% male, 2% other. Um, no surprise to anybody, really. But again, uh, we do need to do a better job of reaching out to the male population. Um, and, and I think that we are doing a good job of reaching men. But to actually um, transcribe that into action so they will take a survey is something altogether different. Um, and so we just need to kind of think outside the box a little bit for that and start hearing um, from more men as well, because we know at least 25% of people with migraine are men. And next slide, please. So we looked at awareness of devices and then bear in mind that, again, this whole survey is going to be skewed towards people who are kind of aware of devices, which is why we had trouble actually getting people to take the survey. So 86% of the people who took this survey have heard of the FDA cleared medical devices for migraine. Kind of interesting that 14% had not, but um, not, no surprise that 86% had. And out of those, we can see that 73% of the people who answered the survey had heard of Cephaly. They're doing obviously a great job of getting the word out there, raising awareness, because it helps that it is not a prescription product, it's over the counter. Um, but they are definitely um, doing a great job of raising awareness about their device. 38% people have heard of GammaCore. Again, this is a prescription device um, and fewer people have heard about it, um, but they're also doing a great job. For Nerivio, great job here. 54% have heard of the Nerivio device. So those are the three devices that have been around the longest and that are the most accessible. Um, going down to Relivian, this is the newest device that was FDA cleared. So no surprise that only 17%, although I thought it was great actually, that 17% of people have heard of the Relivian MG, especially considering how new it is, and that it doesn't have full um, distribution yet. They're still in the middle of launching. Um, and then 11% have heard of the Savvy Jewel, which is also used to be called the STMS Mini. Um, this is the most expensive of the, of the devices, and they went through a bankruptcy and were off the market for a while to most people. And so it's not really a great surprise that there are few people that are aware of it, but still plays an important role in this market. And then 16% of people have not heard of any of the above. So uh, next slide, please. Talking more about awareness of devices. So this is important, I think, especially um, for medical device companies, but also just for the advocacy community in general to see where people are learning about these devices. And again, these are the people who actually took our survey. So skewed towards people who already are starting to think outside the box and looking for other treatment options um, besides uh, pharmaceutical or in addition to pharmaceutical options. So 75% of people have heard about these devices and migraine support groups. I think that's good. We're doing a good job in talking about the devices, especially over the past few years, just raising awareness there. We're doing a good job. We need to keep doing that and keep talking about these devices and be aware that it's not just enough just to talk about them and make posts, but because of the algorithms in most of the social media channels, we need to also be commenting on the posts, sharing the posts, um, because if the social media channel doesn't consider a post to be important, fewer people are going to be seeing them. So we also need to be aware of that as with everything else. 42% of the people who took this survey have learned about the devices from their doctors. So that's also great news that doctors are starting to share about these devices. 25% heard about them from medical uh, websites. Um, so I'm not sure if, it, you know, if that's like uh, articles or maybe American Headache Society, um, but, but they're starting to be talked about. So that's really good that awareness is being raised. 21% learned about them from the manufacturer websites. Uh, they have, all, all of the manufacturers have really good websites of lots of great information. Um, so anybody can go there and learn about it. 
And then out of the people who took this survey, 43% say that their doctor has recommended or prescribed at least one of the above devices to treat migraine or another headache disorder. Now, we don't know if that's because the doctor raised that in the first case, or if it's that the patient said, hey, is this important? Is this something I should try? All we know is that out of the people who took this survey, almost half um, say that a doctor has recommended or prescribed one of the above devices. What I find interesting with that is that 57% is gonna be the other way. So what is it that all these people who've heard about medical devices um, are talking to their doctor, but their doctor is not recommending or prescribing them. Uh, so I find that kind of an interesting statistic and kind of indicative of, of one of the barriers, the access barriers that we're looking at, which is just doctors' awareness of the devices or willingness to prescribe them. Um, and part of that is obviously also going to be the shortage of certified headache specialists. So uh, that obviously is, is an issue in itself. Uh, and next slide, please. So device use treatment. 49% of the people who took this survey currently used or have tried at least one of the medical devices for migraine treatment. Now, obviously, if doctors are not prescribing them, people can't try them except for the cephaly. So there's no great surprise having seen that majority of doctors are not recommending them, even for these people who have taken the survey and have an interest or an awareness. So the 49% is not a surprise, but if we're looking at the devices that have been tried, no great surprise here, cephaly 35%, it's over the counter. Um, and you don't have to go to your doctor. You don't have to wait for them to prescribe it to you. Um, so, so that's an interesting number. 8% of people have tried Gamma Core or currently use Gamma Core. 23% um, have tried or are currently trying Nerivio. And both of those companies also have the ability for you to go to their website and actually have a doctor's appointment with, their, with one of their doctors, they, they work with a company, each of them, so that you don't have to wait to go to see your doctor to see if this is an appropriate device for you, um, or you don't have to rely on your doctor being willing to prescribe it, but you can actually go. And I think that that is a really great service that they offer, um, but many patients are not aware of that. So that's an important aspect of awareness. And then Relivian, <clears throat> no surprise here, 2%, because Relivian is still going through its launch right now. It is only available. Um, in certain headache centers, certain headache doctors are able to prescribe it, others are not because the doctor has to be trained on their HCP platform before they can prescribe it. But they are going through a broader launch uh, later this year. Right now, they're getting feedback from certain patients. And as many people know, I'm one of those patients that they're getting feedback from um, enjoying testing out the Relivian myself. Um, and, and I love the fact that they are working directly with patients for them to try and then to give feedback into their device and into the app as well. It's always great when companies want to get that feedback from patients and we're looking forward to a broader launch. It'll be interesting to see if we were to do the survey in a year or two years time, how these numbers would change. And then for the Savvy Jewel, only 5% of the people who take the survey have tried or are currently trying the Savvy Jewel. Again, no uh, surprise there because it was off the market for a while and now it's gone through a branding name change. Uh, so we'll see what happens with the Savvy Jewel going forwards. And there's a lot of unknowns there. And then of course, 51% of people who took this survey have uh, not tried and are not using any of the devices, which I find fascinating. Next slide, please. Um, I think this is, this still me? Yes. Okay, so quality of care with the devices. So 25% of people who took this survey use the medical device in conjunction with other abortive and or preventive treatments. And so a lot of the time what we do in the migraine advocacy world is we don't say, you know, take a pill and, and that's all you're going to need or use a medical device and that's all you're going to need. Increasingly, uh, most of the advocacy communities talk about a toolbox approach. So you'll take, you know, you'll take uh, possibly a prescription uh, preventive treatment, a prescription abortive treatment, a medical device, or at least one medical device. Maybe you'll take supplements, you have lifestyle changes. You may have some integrative treatment options like a biofeedback or mindfulness, or even acupuncture, massage therapy. Um, and so 25% of people here use their device in conjunction with other abortive or preventive treatments. I would have thought it would be higher than that, um, but that's interesting uh, to see those numbers. 18% of the people who took this survey, now bearing in mind that only 25% are using them in conjunction with other treatments. 
So 18% agree that the use of one or more of these devices has significantly improved their migraine pain and symptoms. Now, for some people, you may think that that's a low number, but for anybody here who lives with chronic migraine or high frequency episodic migraine, um, that's a huge number. You know, that is statistically relevant. It's, statist it's statistically significant for us to know that. Um, and I think that that's huge. Bear in mind, again, half the people who took the survey um, are not using the device. 8% say that it has significantly reduced the amount of medication they're using to treat their migraine. Again, you're looking at that toolbox approach. And I know that that's how I personally approach trying medical devices. And there are two devices that I currently use. Um, I'm always looking at, do I have to take my abortive medication less frequently? Or does an attack stop more quickly so it doesn't last as long? Those are really important things. It's important for patients to track. Um, just to see, because a device may stop one attack, but it may not. You may make up, wake up in the middle of the night with a severe attack that a device may not help. But on the other hand, if you can catch one, you know, in the middle of the day, very quickly after symptoms start, then that may be an attack. You don't have to take medication. And as, from my perspective, that's a win-win. Um, and I think that it's this whole approach, again, for the toolbox. 13% uh, of people who took this survey report that the medical devices are effective in aborting their migraine attacks. Now, uh, the cephaly is approved for uh, preventive care, uh, gamma core is approved for preventive care, and then the Rivio and Relivion are both in clinical trials for preventive treatment. So your doctor theoretically can prescribe that, but it would be off-label for preventive, but it's great that those companies are also working on preventive treatment. Uh, we just don't have as much data right now because it hasn't gone through the FDA clearance process completely. But it's great to see that 30% of people here say that the medical devices are effective in actually aborting their migraine attacks. And I know for myself, if I can catch an attack within 20 to 30 minutes of my earliest symptoms, that's not the pain, that's like the earliest symptoms, then often I can actually stop an attack. Again, that's a win-win for people. And the next slide, please. And over to you. Thank you so much, Shoshana. So you know, that's a good segue into, and first, I think before we proceed, there was a question from an attendee about um, the last slide, which is, you know, statistically significant has a very specific meaning. Can you clarify what you mean by this being significant? That certainly has to do with the number of headache days that, or, or headache days or attacks that have been reduced by usage of the device. So we can probably follow up with you and, and determine what that number is after the webinar and provide that um, when the um, recording is provided. But um, yes, that does have a correlated um, number in terms of reduction of attacks or uh, headache days. Next slide. Barriers to access, insurance barriers. So, you know, we just heard Shoshana talk a lot about how there's definitely generated interest about devices. Even the folks who haven't tried them or want to know more about them. Um, but the follow on is whether or not folks are able to get access to those devices. And we've seen that there are two major barriers there. Number one being with insurance companies being less than willing to provide coverage for devices. And so our survey um, very briefly showed that almost half of respondents have, have actually tried to get a me medical device covered by their payer. And about a third of those um, have said that they know they've hit a wall, their payer has denied coverage. And we can talk a little bit about why that is. And then 5% said their insurance covered the device they were prescribed and, um, and they were successful at least getting partial cover coverage. We're, we're thrilled. We wish that number was a lot higher. 5% um, is a start. But as you can see from Shoshana's previous slides, there's a great greater number of folks who are very interested in in um, trying these devices if they haven't already. And so um, we should talk a little bit about why that is. You know, there's a difference without going down a rabbit hole between FDA, FDA approval and FDA clearance. Devices go through a different process by, which, by the FDA, which they are cleared. But for many insurance companies and payers, they're still deemed experimental because the rigor of either the clinical trial or in this case, um, you know, how they are stacked up against each other and, and in some cases lumped in together makes it very challenging um, for, you know, patients who may have a very specific interest in a, in a certain device. Um, that device might be lumped in with other devices that might have uh, different scientific evidence. So, 
um, you know, on that level, surveys like this help with real world evidence um, to help provide payers some insights about the folks who are using them successfully. Um, but I will say the headache and migraine policy forum along with CHAMP, you know, are really, and Shoshana as, as members of both of those organizations, you know, trying to um, educate payers to help them understand why they should provide coverage. Um, you saw that number of 8% in reduction of um, pharmacological medication. That is a cost savings measure. If you have access potentially to a device to abort an attack, then perhaps you're not taking another therapy. Um, we know that migraine patients are the fourth highest users of the ER. So perhaps instead of going to the ER, um, you know, expending ex uh, resources to the healthcare system and then potentially being uh, prescribed an opioid, um, if they had access to a device, you could potentially save a lot of money to the healthcare system. So helping payers understand um, that there is uh, there are a lot of good arguments for why these devices should be covered. I think what we've found, um, HMPF and CHAMP sent a letter to the 10 largest payers in the country specifically about device coverage. And what we got in return, um, in particular from United Healthcare um, earlier this year was a response about, you know, how they're kind of all the same. And, you know, we, we have um, replied back and let them know, you know, the technology, the difference between a REN unit and a TENS unit that's above um, the level of this webinar today, but the mechanism of actions can be different for some of these devices. So trying to educate them uh, um, in order to get appropriate coding and all of that work. So just know that the community is working on that issue. Next slide. There are also financial barriers. So, you know, even if a, um, you know, if a patient is interested in um, getting access to a device, 36% of the respondents pay for it out of pocket, um, another 5% pay out of pocket with a copay, but they've had to, in, in similar cases, reconsider using it because it's too much without insurance. So you see why in the previous slide, why it's so important that, that coverage follows along. Um, and that oh, the whopping number 77% say that it really is the financial cost that it's what preventing um, patients from trying a device. So there's the concern that they, you know, even if it would work for them, they can't overcome that amount. And so um, again, going back to why we need to make the case with insurers. Um, next slide, additional findings. 36% um, of the respondents first started experiencing migraine or other headache symptoms when they were 18 years or younger. So, you know, some of these devices have approved for adolescent use. And so that's clearly on the migraine journey in a lifetime, um, perhaps a way for those younger patients to access a treatment option. 37% of respondents have children who also have migraine. We know that this is a disease that is passed along family members, so that's not surprising. Um, less than 1% um, have been able to use a medical devi device to treat migraine during pregnancy simply because the sample size here I think was so small and the chances that someone could access a, a device during pregnancy is minimal, but that's absolutely um, a theme that I think the community is trying to drive home next year is that this is a safe and effective option for, for um, pregnant persons. And then 4%, only 4% have ever tried a medical device for migraine before age 18. So, um, you know, in terms of getting access, it's clearly in, in later years as Shoshana outlined. So uh, next slide. Do you wanna talk about the patient feedback or do you want me to relay this Shoshana? These are some pull quotes from the survey that I think, you know. Yeah, I think, I mean, either. Um, yeah. Yeah, if you want to start and then I'll kind of jump in at the end. Sure, yeah. So, you know, the surveys have, um, you know, the ability to have open-ended responses at the end and, and sort of um, some comments from patients who've either tried it or would like to try it. And so this is just a sample of some of those comments. So. Number one, my daughter and I would love to try a medical device, but they're cost prohibitive. And our doctor said it may not help enough to justify paying out of pocket. That could be a misnomer. And that just goes to show that there's a lot of work to be done in terms of clinical education about devices as well. 
Um, another person said, I don't have insurance. I can't afford the devices. It, I'd be more willing to try to buy one if there was a hundred percent guarantee at work. So there's that chicken and egg um, concern. Right. And then, and then if you want to go ahead, Shashan, with the last three bullets. Sure, sure. And I think also just to kind of add to that, the second one you went over, Lindsay, is that the, it is a chicken and egg thing. You know, some of the devices are great and um, have a lower cost for you to try one or they have a return policy. I understand not every company can do that. But when you do do that, that kind of makes it more likely for a patient to want to try it. Um, and also, I know that part of it is a mindset for the patient. For myself, I think that if I can stop a migraine attack, is that a day that maybe I can do some advocacy work or I can write an article? And so I kind of look at the, I try to look at the cost benefit of, of a device working. Um, and, but, but that's just kind of a, a change in perspective um, that maybe we need to talk more to patients about. Uh, so then looking at the third point, uh, saying devices are more effective than medications for me, insurance refuses to pay, obviously, you know, we're trying to work on that. It is an uphill climb, um, but all the companies are also working on that. Um, and we do have a collective, a devices collective that is trying to work on that together as well. Uh, again, reiterating this, I love my device. We took the name of the device out there. Um, it helps, but I cannot afford it anymore. Um, and, and that's kind of, again, that, that's a catch-22 situation because if you bring the device down too low, then the company risks going bankrupt. You know, it's just not financially feasible for them to stay in this particular market. On the other hand, if it is too expensive, then, you know, patients can't, can't use them. And so it, it is, it's a tough thing while we're working on this insurance coverage. I always tend to say, you know, that sweet spot is below $100 a month. For some people, even that is just not going to be reasonable either but I think that seems to be kind of a magic spot again that just may not be feasible for some companies in order for them to stay afloat and we just need to be aware of that put it in comparison with medications you're seeing that one pill is often a hundred dollars just one pill not a month of taking that medication and sometimes more than that especially you know some of the the newer ones they're thousands of dollars so putting it in that perspective these devices are not expensive uh, but we are dealing with insurance issues. So, and the last one here, I think is very important. This is something that I'm working on um, with one of the companies right now, where someone says the devices are not viable for me as I have severe allodynia and these devices often make that worse. And so we're looking at, this is actually an access barrier. And part of it is very real. I myself have very severe facial allodynia. And so the devices are a challenge for me when they go on my face or around my head. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that because you have severe allodynia that you can't use the device. It may be, but it may be that you need to go through a protocol where you are slowly increasing that. And slowly is a relative term. So what someone else may say is slow may not be slow for you. Uh, so right now I'm trying to work on, on a protocol for a device uh, for that for myself. And I'm happy to go really, really slowly. Um, and I've been sick recently. And so my allodynia has been much worse. And so the stimulation level I'm using has had to be much, much lower. And so I think it's just a matter of being patient and not thinking because this happens, that means that I can't use this device or any device. That may be true, but it also may not be true. And it just may mean, mean that, you know, we need to be creative and thinking outside the box. I think we and have next slide. Yep, sorry, right. Lindsay. Oh, no, no I, was, I think we're right at the Q&A portion maybe. Yep. Um, and we have a couple questions in the box here. So if we want to take them one by one, surely, yes. surely noted, can you provide the reference that migraine is the fourth largest user of the ER? Yes, I can certainly find that citation again when we share um, the recording, provide that to everyone. We've widely used that statistic um, and we've, we do have that citation so we can share that. I don't have it off the tip of my, tip of my fingers, but yes, we can share that. The second, the second question, I don't know, Shoshana, if you want to take that, how do we make- Oh, you know, that's more of your thing. I'm okay, going to say this true. is and totally a, your ballpark. Oh, it's a payer question. So yeah, has, Rachel Co asked, so how do we make the case with payers to cover the cost of devices? Even if one can try one of multiple devices, they cannot keep up because of the use of cost. These numbers will not likely budge if there's no financial supplement. So what I would say is that this is an issue campaign. There needs to be some noise from the patient provider community about the, the want and need for this. Um, quite simply, it is number one, having a conversation with your clinical provider um, and whether or not they would be interested in outreaching to their state's health insurance commissioner to say, hey, 
why don't these plans systemically on a state level provide coverage? There needs to be an amount of noise for health insurance commissioners to step in as sort of a third party liaison and, and ask some questions of payers about this. And, you know, um, at the end of the day, you also have to remember that patients aren't necessarily the individual consumers. We may go through, for example, an employer who's purchasing health insurance, have a conversation with your employer or their insurance broker or some HR professional who you may um, be thinking about this time of year with open enrollment and other decisions. Does, does this program or does this um, formulary that we are on, does it include coverage? Raise that question. I think that um, people need to hear that there's a need and a want um, in terms of doing a grassroots campaign and making sure that, um, that folks uh, can be engaged. The, the last thing I would say is we're always looking for either patient testimonials or other opportunities to um, you know, put stories out there in the media and help amplify them with policymakers so they can understand that this is a larger um, question for their constituents. So um, these are two both good organizations to plug into on that. And certainly um, you can reach out to Shoshana or I if you want to be engaged. And that goes, that goes to, I guess, the next question, which is how can patients advocate for coverage with their own insurer? So again, going back to your employer or your health insurance commissioner, but um, the easiest way also, honestly, is to file an insurance complaint um, online. Right. And, and you know, our website under the advocacy tab, headachemigraineforum.org, maybe one of my colleagues can drop the consumer complaint guide link in there. Um, based on your state, as a consumer, every state health insurance commissioner's office has a division of consumer affairs. You can file a complaint and just say, you know, why does my plan not provide coverage? Um, if enough people do that, I think it would generate some noise. I know that there are advocates having one-on-one -on -one conversations with payers. That I know that the clinicians do that as well, but they also need to hear sort of the, from the grassroots. Um, yeah. I would just add to that, that, you know, I always tell people that it's the squeaky wheel that gets the oil. Um, and, you know, and I myself, I'm, I'm guilty of not advocating as much for myself um, in order to get insurance coverage um, yeah. for these devices. Um, but I do know that when I advocate for myself with medications, generally I get it. I have uh, like a 99% success rate. Uh, but, but the way that insurance companies are set up is to discourage patients from appealing. And doctors don't want to do it either because it's a lot of paperwork, but there are ways of appealing. You, you can file a grievance, like uh, Lindsay said. Um, we can, you know, we've even talked about doing like a shame and blame campaign. Um, you know, there's a lot of different things that we can do that kind of speak into some of these other questions as well. So like looking at Shirley's question about the average co-pays. I don't know if you have that, Lindsay, but I know from like hearing in my group, you know, that's, that's kind of, it's a challenging question because there are copay programs for the CGRPs, for all of them, that can bring your copay, if you're part of that program, down to zero dollars for many of them, at least for a period of time. They all have their limitations um, in terms of time and how much money they will pay out for those copay programs. I think the bigger question would be, you know, once your insurance is covering it, or if you're on government funded insurance, what is your average copay? And that can literally be from zero if you have supplemental assistance with Medicare, um, all the way up to uh, seven, $800. I mean, in my groups, we hear outrageous, outrageous copays for the CGRPs that literally are anywhere between five to seven or $800 per month. And so putting that in perspective with the medical devices, just from a financial perspective, it's better for an insurance company to also consider a medical device as well. So, um, so just from the CGRPs, did you want to add anything to that, Lindsay? No, I would say um, we're not, um, I know there's a representative from Theranica on the line. So if they're able to type in an answer or provide sort of that cost differential from their perspective, in, you know, in terms of the average copay for a CGRP versus the cost of the device, we'd welcome that. That's always good information. Right. Again, yeah, we also, we also have um, someone from Relivian here and someone from Gamacore. Okay, great. So, so I have three companies. If folks can, you know, maybe type that in the chat. Um, next question from Eric. Um, wonderful survey, interesting and helpful. Should all the device companies, which I am one, focus less on themselves, increase coordinated efforts to increase awareness and support reimbursement? We always think that um, 
you know, it, it's helpful to ally on certain issues. Obviously, each device company will have their parochial interest and we're not engaging. We always try to stay sort of above brand. Um, and, and I think Shoshana and I share the um, similar theme of there should be more treatment options and less treatment options because for every patient, what works for one may not work for another. But in terms of a coordinated effort, I know CHAMP has put together the migraine um, device collaborative. And so we work through that construct, but also um, work together in terms of, you know, on, on webinars like this. Um, you know, I think that when we sent our letter to United Healthcare, for example, we didn't send it on behalf of any one company. We asked, you know, why aren't you covering devices? And um, specifically, they wrote back, well, kind of they're all the same. And, and th there was inaccurate information on a very basic level. Um, so I think that where we could do a good job of trying to find opportunities to educate payers so that when they're making decisions about formulary coverage and other um, you know, uh, committee meetings that we can make sure they have the right information because clearly right now they don't. Um, right. All right, we have yeah. a lot of questions. Actually, let me just add to that if, if I could. I think that you know there are two different opinions to answer your question, Eric. One is that obviously that everything rises with everything rises with the tide. You know, as it goes up, everything just starts to go higher. And so that perspective is that we should be working together. The other perspective is that all these devices are different, and they are all different. Different nerve systems, um, and so I think that that's important to bear that in mind. My attitude is it should be all things all the time together. So we should be working more together. I don't believe that we are working together enough. Right now, we're at the ground floor of awareness and trying to get um, doctors to prescribe it, patients to ask about them, and insurance coverage um, you know, to start happening. So I think working together is going to help that. But at the same time, you know, obviously, it's important for the devices to differentiate themselves. Um, and then bear in mind that uh, same as medications, people may stack medications. People can stack devices. I use two different devices. So if there's nothing wrong in, in doing that um, as well. And so it's important for patients to understand the difference between these devices. But yes, I do feel that right now, there is a lot of power to be had in working together more so that as that tide rises, we all rise together, all the device companies rise together. Um, and, and I think that that's, that's really key. Um, Rachel had a question, insurance complaint, never heard of this. Can you explain more, please? Um, so each state has their own insurance commissioner. Think of that person as the watchdog, if you will, over any insurance product in their state, whether that's fire insurance, but also you know, home insurance um, providers, but also healthcare insurance. And so um, part of their job is to make sure that there are not um, from a consumer level, because right, if you're a beneficiary, you are purchasing a product. If you are not getting or are not the recipient of the benefits of that product, it's, it's violative of the contract that you've entered. Um, so they sort of interface with payers as a third party watchdog, if you will, but also liaison, just to kind of at least start to understand why is something not happening on a systemic level? Like, you know, a good example, um, uh, we engaged on a prescriber restriction issue in the state of Kansas. There was um, a problem with patients not being able to access therapy unless they went to a very specific type of headache specialist of which there was zero in the state. Well, we, you know, you get the insurance commissioner involved on something like that. So they can sort of investigate and understand what the problem is. Um, each state has, of course, because we live in a 50 state system, has its own website, which I can, you know, is not necessarily intuitive for people to find or, or interact with. We've made it very simple on our website. Um, my colleague, Allison has put the link there. If you click there and you find your state, it will drive you to sort of the web portal to make a complaint. The complaint is not a legal complaint. It is not a legal filing. It is not, um, you know, it certainly could be part of a public record, but it's basically to say, um, you know, this is the issue I'm having. I hope that you'll reach out to the insurance company and both a patient or a provider can initiate that type of a complaint. And essentially that gives, I won't say the ammunition, but the ability for us to then go in to say, to speak with the insurance commissioner and say, look, some of your constituents are having this problem. 
we need to understand why they're not receiving coverage for um, for a device, for example. And so it starts a conversation. It it directs some attention on the payer to maybe be responsive, otherwise when they might not be. And so it provides allyship, but also a constituent level voice on an issue. So if you do care to, you know, have t have time and attention to do that, um, I think that's a step in the right direction. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't see any other questions. If anybody else has um, a question they want to add, let us know. Um, otherwise, we're going to kind of bring this to a close right now and just want to I see that um, Andre from uh, Theranica is checking on the, the CGRP copay um, information. And we just heard from uh, Summer Diaz from GammaCore um, that we're aware of GammaCore device copays at the $50 to $75 level. Um, obviously, some of them are higher, some of them are lower. It depends on which provider you go through. Uh, if you're with the VA, you know, some of these devices are just covered completely, which is amazing. Uh, and they should be. Uh, but, but we need to see that more as well. So, uh, so that's really important information. But I think from my perspective, just looking at the numbers, uh, significantly less expensive for an insurance um, payer to cover a device than it would be to cover a CGLP. Um, obviously, for most people with migraine, it's not a one and done. People need more than one thing. So that's kind of a challenge. But, but there's definitely you know, a case to be made that, um, th that you, they're going to save money if they start covering devices. And you've right. got to talk about the pockets, the bottom line for payers, to be yeah. honest. It, it really an is. ER visit, right? How much does that cost? Moving right. a patient through the ER, um, possibly prescribing them an opioid and the societal burden and challenges of, of opioid misuse and abuse, and then the continued suboptimal treatment of their disease, right? That's a that's not even a Band-Aid, right? That's right. Um, that's a revolving door. And so, you know, there, that's an expensive revolving door. And so where devices can offset some of those costs, I think that um, that case needs to be made and we're trying to make that. Right, and then I, I see the comment from Shelley Kessel about the Miles for Migraine where he says, so, you know, the pharmaceutical companies, they do have more money. You know, they, they can put more money into marketing and going places and they have tables at these races, but you know what, the devices need to be there at the races as well. You know, if we want to start raising awareness, we've got to have medical devices out there. They've got to have a place at the table. They've got to have a face. Um, and because of obviously, you know, less financial resources than big pharma, that may mean sharing a table. Again, as the tide raise, rises, all ships are gonna rise with it. Um, and so I think it's just that different perspective and a lot of companies, a lot of advocacy organizations are trying to do things along those lines. Uh, we, my organization has a brochure about medical devices specifically where we just kind of give the basic information, encourage people to talk to their doctors about it. So it's just kind of getting the word out there that uh, I think that that's really important, but, but that would be a great example that we, we really need, as an advocacy community, we need medical devices to have a place at the table, whatever that means. Um, just to speak to Sharon's comment, and then I'm gonna pass over Diane's to you, Lindsay, uh, where you say Medicare doesn't cover anything on the Revio. Um, that may be true, but I think one of the misnomers about Medicare is that it's just kind of one monolithic kind of thing. But Medicare is very, very complicated. You know, you have supplemental Medicare, straight Medicare, and then you have Medicare Advantage plans and all the Medicare Advantage plans are different, every single one, and they all have their own processes as well. So we hear this a lot with medications too, where people will say Medicare doesn't cover these medications. But actually, a lot of the time it does. It's just a different process to get them to cover. And so we do have a steep climb when it comes to devices and government funded insurance, specifically Medicare, Medicaid. But it's it's not impossible at all. And it's a fight that I think we all need to make together. If we want to start moving that needle. So um, hand it over to you, Lindsay, for Diane's question. Yeah, Diane, that's a really good question. So tip, so no, the answer is no. The state insurance commissioner's purview and oversight is over the state commercial plans. Obviously, states administer Medicaid. That's different. Um, you know, the holy grail is making a, a formulary or coverage change in policy um, at CMS because of so many covered lives and beneficiaries there. And, and honestly, you know, as CMS goes, so go commercial payers. It's sort of, um, you know, as the federal government may do something, then commercial payers may take a lead. But there's something to be said for sort of percolating this on a state level and trying to do what we call, which is terrible, the whack-a-mole approach, which is to help provide coverage on maybe an individual state basis um, and get smaller wins there to build momentum to maybe, 
you know, express to the CMS administrator and others that there ought to be federal coverage. So I would say they're interrelated, but no, we unfortunately can't um, ask the state health insurance commissioner to do that. Yeah, definitely. All right. I think we're kind of about time for the questions. Um, so if we just want to go to the next slide and talk about when on actually the one after that, that's just us saying thank yeah. you for being here. We really appreciate you. Without you, we couldn't be doing this. So um, so thank you, uh, everybody. I also just want to say a quick uh, thank you to you know the companies that um, that sponsor the advocacy organizations. We couldn't do this without you. Um, a shout out here to Aki Smile Shop because they also sponsored this particular survey. They gave away some free products to some survey respondents. Uh, something that I know I'm behind on getting out because I've been sick. But those of you who won a prize, you will get that prize soon. So we appreciate you, Aki Smile Shop. You may want to head over there um, and consider getting a holiday gift um, from there as well. It's an amazing um, patient advocacy organization too. And then moving on to our next survey, uh, which we, are, we moved to February 1st, just to give ourselves all a chance to breathe over the holidays. This is a very important survey. We're looking at step therapy. It's going to open on Wednesday, February the 1st. Um, for everybody who's here, we would love you to participate. We'd love you to share that survey when it is available so that we can raise more awareness. So instead of getting 300 to 500 respondents, maybe we can get 750, you know, even higher. I like to dream big. We know, you know, there are almost 40 million people with migraine in America. Um, and so we want to get the word out. And part of that is doing these surveys. So please keep an eye out on our next survey, which is going to come out on February 1st. The survey will run for one month. And then we will do a summary report. We do have a summary report. And I don't know if Lindsay, do you have that up on your website yet? I haven't put it up on mine yet, but it will it go. Is, yeah, I think it's live on our website. Um, and so if you go to headachemigraineforum.org, and I believe under the tab of resources or educational materials, there will be a position paper and it's listed there. But, but then also at the end of this survey series, Shoshana and I will package all of these into sort of one greater report. So um, for those who either missed other webinars or um, want to kind of see collectively how the, all the information is presented together, we'll anticipate getting that out in the spring. So yes. uh, we're excited. This has been, at least for me, a wonderful series and, and yeah. such good, um, such good uh, response from all of the migraine meanderings uh, folks in the community. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And, and if there's any topics that you want us to cover in 2023, you know, after we do the step therapy one, we've done combination therapy, we've done medical devices, we've done yeah. the emergency room and urgent care, and then step therapy. Um, um, oh, I see that there's actually a typo here. It's on step yeah, therapy, just, not yeah. combination therapy. Um, so just to let you know that. But if there's another topic that you think is hot that you would like us to cover in a survey in 2023, um, let us know uh, because we would love to, you know, to participate and get your ideas for that. And I think that's it, right? Um, I see Shirley said she'd like to see more topics and how patients can work together to nag payers. Yes, amen to that. Maybe not nag. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of the shame and blame type thing, how we can interact. So I think that that's a good thing. Um, insurance pre -auth. insurance pre-auths, yes. I think that that would be a great thing, Lindsay, for us to talk about um, PAs, formulary exceptions, all yeah. these ways that we can. Kind of necessity. Yes. Or Yes, I think tier, so. yeah, tier exceptions. That Definitely would be, do. yep, great ideas. Yeah, um, great ideas. Yeah, all right. Um, I, I think for my end, that's it. Yeah, Sorry, this Lindsay. is a, a lively bunch and we appreciate all the interaction. Um, like I said, look for, I think that we'll be sharing the survey recording, Shoshana, right. and then um, that follow-on report is available on our website and we look forward to the next. So thank yes. you and have wonderful holidays, everyone, as we creep into mid